Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is success in retail logistics with my friend, Mike Jarrett. Mike is the founder of Jarrett, a leading 3PL that does it all, transportation, logistics, warehousing, technology. They do it all. In the interview, we talked about retail logistics, which is one of the areas where Jarrett specializes. Also, Jarrett is hosting the Jarrett Supply Chain Summit on August 10th. Former OSU football coach Jim Tressel is the keynote speaker, but there's a whole bunch of other industry experts who will be at the event. I will put those in the show notes, and you can also see that at the Jarrett website. So check out the links. That event is held in Orville, Ohio, which is in the Cleveland, Ohio area. So check out the interview with Mike Jarrett. But before we get to the interview, I want to tell you about my friends over at Tomorrow. Website is tomorrow.io. Tomorrow has developed a weather intelligence and climate security platform that is custom built to help logistics and transportation companies to reduce the impact of weather on their operations. The cost of weather related accidents, delays, inventory damage, service failures, hours of service problems, they're enormous. But what can we do? We can't change the weather, but we can do a better job of planning around the weather. And that's exactly what they do for you over at Tomorrow I.O. They have their own satellites. This is the next generation of weather forecasting. Check them out at Tomorrow I.O. I will put a link in the show notes so you can reach out and talk to them. So how's it going, Mike Jarrett? Doing great, Joe. Thanks for having me today. I'm very excited to talk to you about this. Retail logistics is a tough area. So I know a lot of people talk about it. Uh, nobody knows it like you. So Mike, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. Well, my name is Mike Jarrett. I'm the CEO and founder of Jarrett Companies. We're a supply chain management company. We focus on managed transportation, warehousing, international, and truckload brokerage, as well as fleet services. We're based in Northeast Ohio, a town called Orville, Ohio. And uh, my background is I, I started my career at Roadway back in the late 80s and then moved to Roadway Logistics, which eventually became Caliber Logistics. And then in the early to mid 90s, FedEx supply chain purchased Caliber. So I worked there until the late 90s before starting Jarrett companies in 1999. Very nice. So I, I looked at your LinkedIn profile. You're very, you just summarized it in 30 seconds, but you have a very extensive career before you started Jarrett. So you started Jarrett in 1999? Yes. So what hold did you see in the market? What, what made you think this is not being done right, or I can do better? What were you thinking in 1999? Well, you know, the 3PL space has evolved over the years, but back in the late 80s, early 90s, it was primarily the automotive sector, which I know you have a background in that, Joe. And so, you know, my responsibilities at Caliber Logistics was GM, Ford, and Chrysler were my three largest customers. And so the automotive JIT milk run supply chain approach was, was really what got 3PL services up and running. So what I saw in the market in the late 90s was a solution a managed transportation solution that would be more uh, executable in both technology and large and small companies that were not served nearly as much back in those days. So the solution when we launched Jarrett was to take a large 3PL solution-based approach and apply it to the mid-sized to larger companies that were underserved by the main players back then in the 3PL space. Yep, yep. And we were talking about before we hit record, and I always say automotive is the biggest, baddest supply chain on earth. I'm sure people would argue with that because there's a lot of very complex uh, supply chains out there. But I think it's a great background to have because it is very demanding. Now, by the way, there's people delivering to Walmart like your company today. I guarantee they're saying, no, it's no more demanding than Walmart. When you're working for big operations, 
the bar is very high. And we'll get more into retail logistics in a minute. But before we do, I know Jackie will kill us if we don't talk about your big event coming up here. So tell us about your big event. Well, Jackie, our senior marketing manager, you're correct, Joe, will definitely want me and you to talk about that. We have the Jarrett Supply Chain Summit. We're really excited about it. It's on August 10th, and it starts at 8 a.m. That's a Thursday. And we have some really great supply chain leaders, thought leaders in the industry coming to be panelists and speakers. Some of those people that are headliners would be Satish Jindal. He's uh, a thought leader in supply chain for many years now. He's coming to be uh, a speaker as well as a panelist. And then we're going to have some people that are fun to, to be here and, and meet and greet with. We've got uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. coming. We have Dale Jarrett. Uh, we have Jim Trestle, the former football coach at Ohio State. He's going to provide a keynote address to the attendees. You know, he's a very inspirational leader. So we're excited about having Jim Trestle there to do that. I, uh, I'm a, I'm a Wolverine. I bleed maize and blue, but I do like Jim Trestle. I will say this: any football coach you hear talk is inspiring. And by the way, I've read. Um, there was a book about Urban Meyer and I read that book and there was a book. It's about Jim Harbaugh. I read that book. They're short books, but these guys, there's another one about Nick Saban. These guys, it's very applicable because they are so focused on, we recruit the very best people to get here and then we train them to keep them here, but we make the best even better. And they talk about process a lot. And I know that's a kind of a Nick Saban thing, but they're all in that mode of, I think I don't think he does anymore, but Jim Harbaugh used to be would grade out every single practice for every single position group. So at the end of the end of the practice, like here's who here's the best wide receivers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it got to be a little much. I think they scaled back on some of that, but you can't find a great football coach who doesn't have something that's good to say about business. I totally agree, Joe. I think there's a lot of overlap. And the one thing that you'll hear from great coaches like Jim Trestle is culture. Yes. And I think that's what sets us apart from our competition. The culture we've established at Jarrett is second to none. And it starts with people. You know, we're a people-centric, tech-enabled company. So we start with people and people in the relationships we have with each other as well as our customers establishes a great culture. And I think you'll see that same thing with you know, sports teams that win year in, year out, it's it's not the X and O's, it's the culture they've established. Yeah, it's, it's, we, you said it's not the X's and O's. I've always heard people say, coaches say, it's not the X's and O's, it's the Jimmy's and Joe's. <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> how do we register? First off, where is Orville, Ohio? That's where it's at. Yeah, it's no, Northeast Ohio. Mm -hmm. So how do I get, that's near Cleveland, right? Near Cleveland, yeah, about uh, 45 minutes south of Cleveland, uh, more closer to Akron, Canton, if you are familiar with that area. And yeah, you just register, go to gojarrett.com, and then you'll see a link to register for the Supply Chain Summit. And then we're having a charity event in the afternoon. It's called Racing for a Reason. Again, uh, Dale Earnhardt, Dale Jarrett, Jim Trussell will be there, and we're supporting a local charity called Heartland Education Community, and we're doing an auction, and then we'll have a concert at the end of the evening with Tracy Bird. He's a Grammy Award-winning country oh, music artist. Wow. wow, you got something for everybody. It's going to be a good time. Yes. So um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll put a link in the show notes so anyone who wants to get there can get there. So I'm thinking that's Cleveland's like – four, four and a half hours for me, oh, four hours from me. But if you're in Ohio, it's not far. <laughs> not bad at all. No, it's an easy drive. And by the way, I was just at TMSA. That's where I met Jackie uh, or should have met Jackie, but I, we met after. There was a ton of people from Ohio. You would think TMSA was half Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Transportation Marketing and Sales Association. 
Well, Ohio's slogan is the heart of it all. So I would I would concur. I think Ohio is the heart of it all. So it's one of those from a supply stuff. chain standpoint, it's a great place to be. We can reach eighty plus percent of the population in two days. So you can't beat Ohio. I, somebody said to me not so long ago, Chicago is the logistics hub of of the country, maybe the Midwest now, who knows? But I was like, that may be, but Michigan, Ohio are the supply chain hubs. <laughs> this is where the supply chain was born, right here. <laughs> so anyway, let's switch gears up again. I'll put a link to the summit in the show notes. so People can sign up for that, but let's switch gears. Today's topic again is success in retail logistics. So you guys specialize. I know you have multiple specialties, but one of them is retail. So do you work with a number of big retailers? You don't have to mention their names. We all know who they are. <laughs> yeah. We about all of them, Joe, in in some form or fashion. Some some are part of our managed transportation solution. Others are in our warehousing division. Others are in our truckload brokerage division. So it's um across the board, really about any major retailer we're working with in some form or fashion. Yep. And by the way, I've said many, many, many times on the podcast, if you're selling something and if you're listening and you make out to make a hundred phone calls a day, <laughs> specialize in something because people aren't looking for sales guys. They're looking for experts in a space. And it's a lot more compelling to call a retailer and say, hi, this is Mike Jarrett. We work with all the major retailers and, uh, I think we understand the problems you might have better than the, than the next guy. That's a lot more compelling than, hi, I've got to make 100 phone calls today to people I don't know about topics that I know very little about. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and I think retailers continue to look at multiple ways, multiple channels to distribute their products through e-commerce, as an example, and they're looking for warehousing solutions and order fulfillment solutions. So... You know, to ha you have to have the expertise to be in that space. And when you're, when we talk about expertise, you, you have to peel back the onion and get to the nitty gritty of what really matters to the retailers that are in that space. And, you know, we're working with CPG companies that are shipping to retailers. We're working with retailers that are, you know, moving their products through e-commerce channels like Amazon. So you have to have expertise in the day-to-day -day details of their business. Otherwise, you're not going to stand out from any other competitor. Yep, yep. And to your point, the, now we have this omni-channel and that has some challenges because we don't always know how we're going to sell. You know, So you might sell a lot more at the retail location on Saturday and Sunday, but Monday through Friday, there might be more e-commerce orders. And someone in the background, most likely Jarrett, has to manage that inventory because carrying excess inventory is the kiss of death. We all worry so much about logistics costs, transportation costs, inventory carrying costs, throwing stuff out because it didn't sell. That is that is a big cost and we have to go after that in the retail supply chain. Yes, definitely. So are you doing warehousing for these companies and transportation? Yeah, actually, that is kind of our sweet spot is providing managed transportation, whether it be LTL, truckload, expedite, small parcel with CPG and, and retail companies, combining that with order fulfillment and warehousing services. Oh boy. That really is our sweet spot. You know, because in, in the retail space, you have to understand, like, for example, Walmart has the on time in full, OTIF is their terminology. If you don't, if you're not on time and in full, then you're going to get penalties. And so we manage that process for, you know, companies like, you know, Earth Animal, as an example, they're shipping to Walmart. They're a specialty uh, pet food, pet uh, treats company where we do both managed transportation as well as warehousing order fulfillment. Uh, Smuckers is another CPG company that ships to all the major retailers that we're doing those services for, both on the warehousing side as well as the managed transportation. Folgers is another brand that we work with. On the retail side, Bath & Body Works is a retailer we work with in their retail supply chain. And, and each, each solution has to be customized 
for those customers with ultimately the goal is to handle these responsibilities in a way that not only optimizes their supply chain, but allows them to focus on things that matter most to them. Yep. And by the way, the retailers are getting very demanding with those CPGs. I think they learned a lot during COVID. One of the things they learned is in some cases, we have a lot of choices. You go to the grocery store, you go to the certain aisles and you go, God, there's 25 different kinds of syrup for my pancakes. Uh, do I need 25? And I think what the, some of the retailers have learned is they sold more when there was less options. And so they started saying, let's, let's cut back on some of this. And by the way, we see lots of retailers like Aldi, Trader Joe's, Costco, fewer SKUs. Why do they have fewer SKUs? By the way, those are all wildly successful companies. They have fewer SKUs because it's less to manage. And I know this, they're looking at OTIF on time and in full as one of the ways they grade out their partners in the CPG space. So somebody might say, oh, well, we got dinged. We had to pay a little bit of money or we got penalized somehow because we were you know, below our KPI on on time and in full. But it might be way more than that. You might lose that shelf space. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing that we provide value to the retail and CPG space is consolidation of the truckload. Their cost per pound is driven down significantly and service is improved when you can combine LTL in the truckload and send that one full truckload to the distribution center. It's another value added service that we provide that you know, you when you can do that for that that space, it drives down their cost and improves visibility, which is exactly what they're looking for. Yep, and I'll I'll mention one other OTIF problem again. I think that the the superficial way to look at OTIF is as long as we meet the KPI, we're okay. Another way to look at it is you, if you don't meet the KPI, not only do you upset a customer, you might get a penalty, financial penalty. You might get Called, you might get pushed off the shelf because they say that they're not here a lot of times. But also, if I don't get that syrup in the aisle on time, my customer tries another brand. <laughs> right? I'm supposed to be. Right. I'm supposed to be with this one, but I picked this one and go. Oh, I actually like this one better. So the so it's not just hey, did I deliver it on time? Of course, that's important. The retailers are de determining their partners based on these on on this performance, and consumers are potentially going to try your com competition if you aren't there. By the way, I'm a, I'm a perfect example. I drink way too much Diet Coke. I used to drink Diet Pepsi, and I worked at a place where they had one of those garbage trucks. We called it, but it was a food truck. Would show up, and they were always out of Diet Pepsi. The guy goes, "I got Diet Coke." I'm like, I don't want Diet Coke. I want Diet Pepsi. Then I started drinking Diet Coke. I got used to it. Yeah. Isn't that, that was, amazing? Yeah. You, you, you switched a brand based on a supply chain inefficiency. You know, yes. And it happened. Pretty common. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I think we're going to see some changes in the retail supply chain because I do, I do know Target and Walmart are now doing some distribution right out of their stores, some e-commerce fulfillment. So are they going to get to the place where they have fewer SKUs on the on the shelves? I, I suspect they might. I think they'll have it. It'll just be in the warehouse. They'll say, we'll deliver it to your house tomorrow because we didn't we don't have it on the shelf. So so managing the omni channel is going to get harder, not easier. <laughs> totally agree. I, I think we're heading down that path where decisions are going to be made at the C-suite level more connected to supply chain than other things that have driven decisions in the past. Because cost comes into play too. You know, getting your products to the shelves on time and in full at the lowest cost possible, you know, drives decisions more so than they have in the past. You know, supply chain as a cost of goods continues to go up. So I think it catches the attention of the C-suite more than ever. Yep. And by the way, before we hit record, we were talking a little bit about small parcel with the challenges with UPS. We, we averted a strike, which is great. 
but we also know that we're going to see a big rate increase because their costs went up, which means our costs go up. And getting back to automotive, when you and I both worked in automotive, automotive logistics is pretty efficient. We always have full trucks. We, we have a lot of predictable lanes. I think it's 5 or 10% of revenue is what your logistics spend. When you look at e-commerce, very different. The logistics spend is like 20, 25% of that e-commerce shipment. So it is not only is that a, a cost, but it's also going to determine whether you make those sales or not to the end consumer. Yeah, I, I think the recent contract that UPS signed with uh, the Teamsters is going to necessitate an increase in that space. And we know because it's a duopoly, FedEx Round will match the rate increases that UPS will be needing to implement. So I think it all uh, will, uh, again, drive more decisions on, you know, on the supply chain decision makers on how do we move our goods to the end user in the most cost-effective way and still meeting the customer experience requirements. And I think you're going to, I think you're going to see some shifting as a result because uh, there, there, there is going to be some large increases coming on the parcel side. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned the, the, we have UPS and FedEx and it feels like that's the only game in town. And I, by the way, I also understand, I have not read the contract, maybe you have, but the UPS won't be utilizing the postal service for as many for the final mile. That's correct. That's been restricted by a certain percentage. I don't recall the number off the top of my head, but yes, that was part of the contract. So that means the cost is, well, the final mile is the most expensive piece. And now all of a sudden we're switching from kind of a known entity, which is the postal service to, you know, a more expensive resource. I'm guessing the Teamsters are more expensive than, uh, than the uh, postal service. Yeah, it's, I, I would assume so. But yeah, I, I think a lot will have to shake out there. So on, on what's, what's happening there. Getting back to it, I know when we talk about small parcel, I told you just yesterday I interviewed the guys from Sendel and they aren't quite there yet as that, you know, they're at FedEx, UPS level, but they are an option. Tusk Logistics has been on my podcast. They are an option. They, these are t- technology companies. I won't say all technology companies, but they've used technology to connect a lot of the great regional carriers. So I think we're going to see a lot of interest in getting a third, fourth, fifth option for people who ship small parcel like you. <laughs> well, I, I think so. You know, and we can't forget about Amazon. Oh, yeah. Amazon continue, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. They continue to build out their network with warehouses and a contractor model. It's been very effective. I think you'll see them step that up as well. Uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of things I think will take place over the next five to ten years within the parcel space, and I think it's another reason why you know C level people within large and small companies should take a look at supply chain and how it impacts their overall cost of doing business. Yep, absolutely. So I know you work with a lot of these retailers, and I'm wondering. I know we're post COVID now. Hallelujah. I, I, for a long time, I was afraid to say it, but I'm confident now we're post COVID. I'm sure that was a painful time for you. You got a lot of employees, a lot of locations. What were some of the takeaways? What were some of the things you learned uh, about retail the hard way or the easy way <laughs> during COVID? <laughs> well, first of all, expect the unexpected. That was the first thing. You know, that was unprecedented times. And I think that, you know, each, each company that we worked with handled COVID in, in their own way. We tried to keep our, our teams together, obviously, as long as we could. And then we sent people home. We brought people back as quickly as we could because culture is so important to who we are as a company. And I feel that you need to be together in order to maintain relationships, which is the, the heart of culture. So that um, allowed us, but, you know, obviously technology was huge. Our, our technology played a big role in maintaining service levels with our customers throughout the COVID timeframe. I think that what we learned is that you've got to be flexible with situations that come up on the fly. And that's one of the things that we're really good at. We're, 
a family owned company, which means that we can adjust and be flexible with our customers, but we're a large company. So we have the broad base of services to be able to accommodate whatever our customer needs in the supply chain space. So we're very unique in that regard and it, it makes us uh, different from our competition. I think family owned is a competitive advantage for us, allows us to be flexible, but we're also a very large third party logistics company in many different verticals so we can accommodate whatever the customer needs. Yep. So I want to take a quick time out to talk to small parcel shippers. I'm talking to you e-commerce sellers and the three PLs who serve them. I'm talking to you retailers. We got some great news this week. UPS is not going on strike, which is fantastic news for all of us, for the economy. The bad news is there's going to be a double digit rate hike somewhere in the neighborhood of 11 to 12% according to experts. I just saw an article in Freight Waves about it. But what choice do you have? UPS and FedEx are the only game in town. Until now, Tusk Logistics, that's T-U-S-K Logistics, is a national network of the best regional small parcel carriers. Yes, I said national. Tusk will save you money, up to 40% in some cases. They have great pre-negotiated rates with the best small parcel carriers in the country. Tusk will also provide you proactive support and easy implementation because it's probably already integrated with your technology. Check them out at tusklogistics.com. And when you get there, click the Get Started button. Do yourself a big favor, save some money, go to Tusk Logistics. So getting back to it, you know, one of the things that's come up quite a bit on my podcast lately is we saw a growth in e-commerce, especially during COVID a lot of those companies have kind of fallen back from their highs. And as a result of all those e-commerce companies growing, we saw a ton of logistics and fulfillment companies pop up and a lot of them venture capital backed. And they took, when you take VC money, you got to grow. And they said yes to a lot of business that they weren't wild about later on. And I've been hearing a lot of people say, yeah, this wasn't a good fit. So you have a lot of companies that were focused very much on growing really rapidly and taking on e-commerce business, but not necessarily traditional warehousing. So Mike, walk us through what you do with your clients day to day, your your retail clients. I know there's a, a big order, but give us just pick any customer. You don't have to say their name and walk us through what you do for them on a daily basis. Well, you know, each customer is pretty similar in the first step, and that is we connect through either API connectivity with their ERP system so that their orders can come to us into our TMS platform, which we, once they hit our TMS platform, which is called JSHIP, it allows our logistics coordinators who are working in that CAT team, that customer account team for that customer to begin assigning the lowest cost, best service carrier, consolidating orders into truckload. Once those orders are assigned and consolidated, then we're reaching out again through API connectivity with our partner carriers to book those shipments within our customer's ERP system. So the customer then is provided with bills of lading and other documentation that basically sets the shipment up in their system. So it's ready to, for the warehouse location or the shipping location to prepare the order to ship. We're also, with most of our CPG and retail customers, doing warehouse order fulfillment for them. That allows us to uh, use our warehouse management system. It's a cloud-based WMS that's connected to our transportation management system, which is, makes it very seamless for us to be able to combine orders, route shipments on the lowest cost, best service carrier, and then assign those shipments in our own warehouse location. And then we'll, of course, send EDI advanced ship notices to our customers, letting them know that their shipments are on the way. You know, we're, we're shipping shipments to B2B customers, brick and mortar customers that are using a distribution or dealer network. We're also doing direct to consumer, which, uh, 
would be shipments that are being sold on our customers' websites or through Amazon. So does that mean that you're, I'm assuming, so when you say ship, you're shipping from your, one of your warehouse locations, you have those all over the country, and you're shipping it from your warehousing company, your, your warehouse location to their retail outlet? That is correct. Yeah, if it's say a Bath and Body Works example, we are handling vendor shipments for Bath and Body Works through our managed transportation solution. If it's say an Earth Animal shipment, which is a uh, a pet treat uh, company that has dealers all over the country, we're shipping B two B to their dealers. We're also shipping to Amazon for them, Chewy dot com. And then we're also handling all of their order fulfillment for their web orders or direct to consumer. So it, it does vary depending on what channel that customer is, is in from a supply chain standpoint. So you have within your warehouses across the country, you have inventory for a lot of your customers in there that has to be managed. And I'm curious, like, is that all based on kind of past? sales performance that they deliver that to your warehouse? Like we think we'll sell this much of this product because I know these, a lot of the stuff's coming from Asia, not, not all the food, of course, but a lot of the stuff you would have would come from Asia and it's got to be brought over the, over the ocean and put in some warehouse somewhere to wait for sale. Right. Absolutely. And you know, inventory management is a key strategy for our, our customers and we play in that environment for them with our warehouse management system. It allows them to have visibility to orders in a real-time basis, what orders are picked, real-time, it's updated uh, within 30 seconds of every time we scan orders with our handheld. So customers know what their inventory looks like, how quickly certain SKUs are moving out of the warehouse, so they know to replenish inventory on a timely basis. Yeah, so in the past, not so long ago, when you and I started probably in this business, you would look at a warehouse. And when you walk through a warehouse, it always seemed like half the stuff was never going to be sold. It was, it was, it was sent to that warehouse to die. <laughs> that, that we recognize is wildly expensive. First off, they got to pay for it to sit on your shelf, whether it's going to sell or not. So I think more and more companies are looking to data to say, how do we get the right SKUs in the right warehouses so we can sell them? And by the way, all the consumers expect same day, next day, which means your warehouse can't be on the other side of the country. It has to be in a metro area close to that person. Very much so. And and that's why we, we have, of course, our own warehouses that we own and operate, which are here in Orville. We're adding on to our warehouses here in Orville to have around 400,000 square feet of warehouse space. And then we have another warehouse in eastern Pennsylvania, which services that eastern seaboard. But we also have partnerships that provide us with 45 million square feet of space throughout the country. And that, 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 those partnerships will allow us to move into markets where our customers on an as needed basis. Yeah. And by the way, I had Summit Hogue on my podcast not so long ago. He is a warehouse warehousing real estate. And one of the things I, I think is very risky you mentioned you have partners. Warehousing has become kind of a a dangerous business in some regards because you go buy these warehouses in certain areas and or lease space at them. And things change very rapid. Like in Reno, I have a friend who's in Reno and he said this, the salaries skyrocketed and the area grew. And all of a sudden, everybody who wanted to work at the warehouse was driving 45 minutes to get there. So being nimble, being able to get in and out of relationships now is pretty darn important because, and we also know this during COVID, we we have to figure out how to get warehouse workers in make it a good job because it's a tough job, but it, we need those people in the, in the building. Otherwise, none of this works. Absolutely. I, I think flexibility is the key there, Joe, on the warehousing side, because like you said, things change quickly. And, you know, there's challenges with labor and there's challenges with finding the right space to hit the density for where your customers are located. So by having partnerships with these warehousing firms allows us that 
flexibility to flex up or flex down depending on what our customer needs are. Yep. And by the way, I've also heard, and maybe you know this also, that in the past, if a company said we need a million square feet, let's just say a huge company, we have a, need a million square feet for the holiday rush. But usually we only need a half a million square feet. In the past, they might have kept a million square feet all year long. Now they're more likely to say, we will have this 500,000. And then when we need to flex up, as you said, we will flex up. And in January, flex back down again. Yeah, definitely. And because the cost is cost structure has gone up significantly. And depending on what market you're in, you know, what we're seeing is, you know, in the along the eastern seaboard, the cost structure has gone up much faster than other parts of the country. And then we're seeing that it might be better from a you know, western distribution center to be more in Salt Lake as opposed to Reno or Los Angeles because of the cost structure. But that's, you know, it's it's crazy you should say that because, and I know you're right, a few years ago, somebody said, yeah, probably more than a few years ago, said, we're in Reno because Reno is same day for parcel, same day to LA. LA is also same day for LA. So we got this much cheaper workforce in Reno. Well, that was great until Tesla and everybody else showed up in Reno and all of a sudden became a boom town and salaries doubled there. So, so you have to figure out, well, how do I get out of this? <laughs> well, yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's more labor than anything else. It's finding people to fill those positions in Reno is, is, it's really hard to find people. LA is really hard to find people because it's over the years been a dense market for distribution. Salt Lake City is kind of the new frontier on the West Coast. And so that's why we've got partners there that we're working with for our customers. We've seen, we've seen a massive migration of people and business move from the Northeast to the Southeast. We're still in the middle here, Mike. So yeah, you're in the, that's right. but, <laughs> but we've seen it and you know, this, these are normal, but we've also seen a lot of people that leave California, get to Utah, Montana, New Mexico, Wyoming, places that were, you know, seemingly empty not so long ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and the work from home hybrid approach has, I think, been conducive to those relocations. And, you know, we, we have to admit Salt Lake City, uh, you know, Denver area, Montana, those are scenic areas. And if you can work in a home environment and, and live in those areas, I think people will choose that in a lot of cases. Yep. Yep. So getting back to retail logistics for a second. So you're working with a lot of large retailers, and I'm assuming some of it comes from Asia. How do you get stuff from Asia? We have an international freight forwarding division as well. So we handle imports and exports for our customers. What uh, is a really um, excellent way to, to provide our customers with visibility on both imports and exports is we utilize Forkites for our platform for tracking shipments. So Forkites will ping our TMS platform every 30 seconds with an update on where their container is at. Whoa, it, uh, love it. Separates us from a lot of the freight forwarders out there. And, you know, because a lot of the, especially with all the disruptions that have occurred in international over the last few years, um, customers want to know where their containers are at and so they can plan accordingly. The other thing we do that's different from our competition is we'll bring the containers into our warehouses and we'll do quality control. We'll strip the container, put the container uh, goods into our warehouse, and then perform the order fulfillment services on those on those products for the customer. So it's a soup to nuts approach on international, where products coming inbound from say Asia or from uh, you know uh, uh, European countries, we can handle any of those containers for them bring it into our warehouses and they can pick, they can pick Long Beach if they choose. We know we've had a lot of issues with Long Beach. So we're seeing more and more containers coming in through Norfolk, Charleston and uh, other uh, East Coast ports in order to get their products quicker and without uh, any kind of issues that are going on on the West Coast. Yep. Yeah. I think we're seeing a migration of 
port traffic to the not only to the East Coast, but also the Gulf. I think the one of the fastest growing is in Savannah, where we were all just at in Savannah for TMSA. And I'll say this because this is how I look at the world. I look at the world from order to cash, right? From the time I get to the order to the time I get my money, how long is it? And for a lot of complex supply chains, maybe for a lot of the retailers you work with, that could be 16 weeks from the time I get the order. To, at, yeah, I might need to put it on a shelf and that might not be the end customer order. But a lot of times when we look at our logistics and supply chain, we have a whole bunch of handoffs. So I have my freight forwarder, hands it off to a warehouse on the West Coast, and then a trucking company picks it up. And they're all different companies and there's not one technology. And I, I'll, ideally, you can get connected on the technology, but I like that you do it all. There's one throat to choke or more likely one back to pat. <laughs> Well, and I, I think I think what we're seeing is a lot of customers want the single source, the international flow of goods, you know, because you have a lot of moving parts. You've got agents you work with in Asia and Europe, and then you have the container companies that uh, you have to work with on dredge and chassis. Of course, you have the steamship lines, and then once it receives uh, here in the port of entry, whether it's West Coast, East Coast, or even the uh, the Gulf Coast, you now have to work with, you know, the unloading at the docks as well as getting the container onto your chassis for your drage carrier. So um, we, we handle that for the customers so that they don't have to worry about it. And we're providing that visibility all along the way for them. I love it. I love it. And again, I, before we hit record, I was talking to you about obviously over the road transportation is super important, but we're also seeing the importance of warehousing and fulfillment. You can't do omni-channel with just over-the-road transportation. We need we need the warehousing and fulfillment. We also need the freight forwarding. And again, it's it's it has to be one integrated system. And and I know that we we the nature of our industry is to have partnerships, and I think that will continue to be the way. But somehow, some way, we have to get tighter and tighter because we all know during COVID how bad it was with the ports. It's one thing not to get unloaded and not to get your stuff. It's a whole other thing where you can't say, I have no idea where that container is. And we had a lot of that going on. Yeah, that's right. And so visibility plays a key role in that. And that's where you have to have a technology infrastructure, which is what we have, because you can um, you can execute operationally, but if you don't have the technology to provide visibility to the customers, they're they're really they're really going to be left in the dark, and that doesn't fly anymore. I think that you have to have a technology platform that's robust and provides customers with visibility. You know, it's 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 not rocket science. You you want to provide the customers with the status of their shipments, where it's at and the ETA on it, and if it's going to be delayed, proactively communicate that to the customer so they can plan accordingly. You know, we use a control tower, we call it our routing center, to do that. Each of our customers are assigned to a customer account team. The customer account teams have six to eight people in them, and they're constantly communicating with, with customers on where their shipments are at and what their ETA is, if it changes, with what the new ETA is. Those things are just fundamental in providing a world-class service to your customers. Yep, yep. I think, I think the actionable insights. And by the way, we we also know this. Amazon's always the big, big uh, elephant in the room. Amazon told a lot of companies, "You're not the right kind of customer for us," and they priced them out of of their marketplace, which is fine, right? They did that with data. They were able to say, we are not the right fit for this customer. So they pushed some people out. And other customers said, we want to better control the customer experience. So I see warehousing and fulfillment and companies like yours that kind of are do all growing into that space for retailers and for the CPGs that say, yeah, we, we, we can do it all. We can give you that Amazon-like experience. And we can give you the additional control you want over your brand because we all love Amazon. But when you go on Amazon and say, I'd like to buy these kind of shoes, they'll go, are you sure you don't want one of these other 60 pairs of shoes? You're like, 
no, I want those shoes. <laughs> that is not what I would want if I was selling Joe's shoes. I would not want, hey, I'll show you every shoe under the sun other than Joe's for a minute, if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I think what it comes down to is, do you have a culture in your organization where you're going to take care of the customer? As, as a family owned company, we have that. We have the, the uh, scalability of a, a large 3PL, but what backs up that scalability is a family owned culture where our people truly care about the customers and they care about each other. I think that makes us different from our competition. Yep. And um, this has been a recurrent theme about warehousing and fulfillment. That work is hard work. You have to, it, there has to be some meaning beyond I'm getting a paycheck. If you're not appreciated, if you don't feel like you're part of something, if you just say, I'm just a strong back to these guys, I'm just somebody who can walk around a warehouse all day, that's, that's not the way you keep people, especially in this market it's going to get harder and harder to keep people. So if, if you can say I'm part of something and uh, they care about me and I'm going to have some opportunities to grow here, that matters. It really does, Joe. I, it, it's a great lead in to, you know, one of our customers where we're shipping their products, many SKUs into Home Depot and Lowe's, you know, they moved their warehouse order fulfillment from Atlanta, Georgia to our facility here in Orville, Ohio, because, they kept running into problems with turnover with their current warehouse provider or the previous one. And so what we're able to demonstrate because of the type of culture we have with taking care of our employees, there's more stability, there's less turnover, and the work ethic is different in our environment, which creates faster, faster orders going out the door, fewer errors, fewer misships, better communication. And those things are big. That's a big deal. I think little things with uh, poor performance due to in turnover can really um, cause problems for retailers like Lowe's and Home Depot. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I've uh, I've experienced this in the past with uh, warehousing and fulfillment companies. It, I was advising a shipper on a warehousing company they were using. They had high high turnover, and you kind of just got a sense. You walked through their facility; it was a little sloppy. It just you could just see there's no pride in in the in the facility, and it's you know we're going to have a big shortage of people here very soon as the baby boomers continue to retire. We're going to be four hundred thousand people short. There's four hundred thousand fewer people in this next generation. How we deal with that is going to have to be beyond technology. We're going to, of course, use technology and automation, but it has to be something more because people are not going to go to a job when they have other options that doesn't treat them well. Totally agree, Joe. You know, and, and one of the things that we really focus on is providing a platform for our employees to really get fulfillment out of their job. And, and I think that's the difference maker in recruiting and retaining the best people. You know, when you make an impact, you feel you're making an impact in your organization. You're, you know, people care about what you're doing. They recognize you for doing a job well done. That provides that employee with fulfillment in their, in their job. And I think that's a, to me, that's a building block of a winning culture. Yep. I agree. So I want to wrap this bad boy up. Mike, Jerry, give us your final thoughts on this topic. What does it take to be successful in retail logistics? Well, I'll start with people. As I have throughout this podcast, I think you have to be a, a people-centric, tech-enabled logistics company in today's world. So it, it takes people. Um, at the end of the day, supply chain is about relationships. And so I think you need to have the right people on the right seats on the bus and have a culture that uh, wins the day for you, your customers, and all of your employees. That's the first thing. I think the second thing is I think you have to have a robust technology platform that provides customers with real-time information, real data, advanced analytics, and visibility to their shipments. 
And then secondly, and then uh, along with that, I think the expertise in the retail and CPG market. As we talked about earlier, it's a very unique space for supply chain. You know, the on-time install, the chargebacks, the penalties that retailers will push back to uh, manufacturers on, all because the execution isn't there. You have to have that expertise in that space. And last but not least, I think you have to have a, a company that's flexible. And I think our flexibility in working with our customers in this space, because we're family owned, gives an, us an advantage over our competition. I love it. I love it. So, Mike, I like to interview smart, interesting people like you who are killing it in the space. Who else should I interview? Well, we've talked a lot about what's going on in the industry, and we could probably spend another hour talking about yellow in that situation. We briefly talked about parcel. You know, UPS did ratify, or their, the rank and file is looks like they're going to ratify the new contract. I think there's a lot of disruptions that's um, taking place in the parcel world. So, you know, with e-commerce continuing to grow at double-digit clip, I would recommend you talk to um, Berkeley Stafford. He's a CEO of Trans Impact. Trans Impact is right. one of our partners on the parcel side, and they're very smart and fast-growing company focused on the parcel side of the business. I love it. I will follow up with Berkeley Stafford. If I can't get him on LinkedIn, maybe you can send me his email. So what I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile. I'll put a link to your website and any other links you and Jackie give me. I'll put those in the show notes. What conferences besides the Jarrett Supply Chain Summit will you guys be at in the coming months? Well, we're going to yeah, we're going to be at the CSCMP conference. It's in Orlando this year. Nice. It's uh, late September, early October. That's one of my favorite conferences to go to. It goes back many years of I think being one of the foremost thought leader and supply chain professional conferences. So we'll we'll definitely be there. But I do want to plug the Jarrett Supply Chain Summit again, Joe. It's on August 10th. starts at 8 a.m. here in Orville, Ohio. As I mentioned, it's going to have Jim Trestle. It's going to have Dale Earnhardt Jr., Dale Jarrett here. And then we also, you know, we have a lot of supply chain thought leaders. We're going to have Todd Poland, the VP of Pricing at Old Dominion. Uh, we're going to have oh, wow. Keith Jindel. We're going to have a number of other thought leaders in supply chain. I think it'll be a, a great event. So hopefully some of the people out there listening to this podcast are able to make it. Go to gojarrett.com to register. Yep. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can reach out and uh, connect with uh, and and register for that. Is it, does it cost anything? No. It does not cost anything. There you go. There yes. you go. See, guys, there's a lot of expensive places to go. This is free. And uh, by the way, are you related to Dale Jarrett or just uh, just the same name? I'm not. We He is our spokesperson. We uh, sponsor NASCAR through uh, Dale Jr.'s motorsports team called Junior Motorsports. Dale Jr. Is, 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 or Dale Jarrett is one of our spokespersons, but we're not related. Most people ask that question. And... We've, we've looked at our family heritage on both sides, and we have not made the connection. Oh, damn. <laughs> but he's a great guy, though. He's a great spokesperson. He's a high-character, high-integrity person who is a, a NASCAR Hall of Famer, so we're glad to have him on our team. Excellent, excellent. So, again, I'll put all those links in the show notes so people can reach out and talk to you. And, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Joe. Yep. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.